Welcome to our Lunar New Year, New Year cooking demonstration. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for taking time to be with us today. We'd love to know where you're joining us from. So please say hello and share where you're at in the chat box so we can see where people are coming from. Well, I know where I'm coming from. I'm coming from Iowa. And I know where Chef's coming from and he's coming from San Francisco. And we got, oh, hello, Ohio, Los Angeles, Bradford, New York, Anderson, South Carolina, lovely snowy New Jersey, <laughs> Boston, old or cold Chicago, Santa Clara, California, Atlanta. Awesome. We're glad you could be here. We hope you enjoy yourselves. We've got a, a couple Oh, I suppose I'd call them technical housekeeping things that we want to run over first. Um, we encourage you to uh, ask questions. And when you do that, use the, the Q&A on the bottom of the Zoom screen, Zoom screen to, to get them to us if you want. Um, we're also, or we also welcome commentary over in the chat section. So please note when you're sharing comments or questions on chat, that there are two options. Uh, of course, option one is panelists and option two is panelists and the attendees. So select the way you want it to go accordingly. This is, this is a neat, unique uh, opportunity we've got here. And I wanna take a moment to introduce myself. I'm Ron Martison, I'm a Nyman Ranch farmer. I live about 45 miles straight east of Omaha, Nebraska. I sold my first pigs into the Nyman Ranch system in 2002. So that's been 19 years ago. Um, we're a small family farm. We're a fifth, gener fam fifth generation family farm. And anybody that knows me knows that I firmly believe that we would not be raising pigs if it were not for Nyman Ranch. And when I say that, I don't say that for myself. I say that for 650 other independent family farmers just like me. What, what is so special about Nyman Ranch? What sets us apart? Well, tonight is a prime example. I mean, think about it. Nyman Ranch is, is what they have taken our pork, that pork that was raised on my farm, and they have uh, put it into the hands of amazing chefs and amazing restaurants all across the country. We are lucky enough tonight to have Chef Brandon Jew um, be with us. And I would consider uh, Chef Brandon one of those amazing chefs. And right now I'm honored to introduce him to you. And I'm gonna share just a little bit about him. For instance, Brandon Jew, wave Brandon so they all know you who you are. Oh, and by the way, would you notice his outfit? Not only does he have on a Nyman Ranch apron, but look at his hat. He's got on a Nyman Ranch stocking cap. Thank you, Brandon, way to support the cause. Brandon Jew is the executive chef and he's the owner of Mr. Jew's, which is a contemporary Chinese American restaurant. And it's in the heart of San Francisco's Chinatown. Mr. Jew's uh, combines the local, seasonal and organic bounty of the Bay, the Bay Area with classic Chinese techniques and flavors. This restaurant celebrates its place in the historic neighborhood working to devolve, or evolve and define Chinese American cuisine in the Bay Area. Good for you. Now, Brandon's training spans from Bologna, Italy, clear to Shanghai, China. And I'm not the sharpest knife in the drawer, but that is a long ways apart, a long ways around the world. In addition to that, he has studied and worked in many, many, many restaurants in the Bay Areas. I find this kind of interesting. He considers Judy Rogers, from the Zuni Cafe and Michael Tusk from Quincy's and his grandma, Yang Ying, to be the most influential mentors in his life. Wow, good for you. Brandon has appeared in the New York Times. He's appeared in the Wall Street Journal and on Mind of a Chef, Ugly Delicious, Taste the Nation and Vice Munchies. Some of Brandon's honors for Mr. Jews include one Michelin star, Bon Appetit number three, 
on the 2017 Hot 10, uh, San Francisco's Magazine Chef of the Year. And he has been a James Beard nominee for Best Chef West in 2018 and 2020. I can't wait to see what you're gonna to put together for us, Chef. So I'm gonna turn it over to you and I, I'm ready. Thanks, Ron. Um, man, after hearing all that again, I realized how old and how much time I've been in the kitchen. Um, but uh, it's a pleasure to be um, here on this uh, demo. Um, obviously, everyone out there, you know, this is something that is very new, and I'm really um, uh, just thankful for Nyman Ranch for supporting uh, independent restaurants um, any way they, that, that they can. And, and um, this way is, is um, a new way during, during the pandemic, but it's a very effective way it's for me to still be able to teach um, and also um, hopefully one day have you taste. But until then, um, I'm hoping you might have uh, a little bit of time to put this together. Um, meatballs. Uh, this is a this is um, obviously like almost every culture has a meatball. Um, in China, this uh, this gets inspiration from Shanghai. Um, it's called a lion's head meatball, and there's no lion um, or any heads in here. Good. Um, yeah. <laughs> this is all pork. Um, all Nyman Ranch pork. Um, we kind of made the recipe a little bit easier to access. The things that we do also, if you have access to other parts or other cuts of, of the pig. Um, so um, let's just for a couple uh, ingredients, um, just just so uh, we can kind of uh, go through it. This is this is. Um, the Nyman Ranch ground pork that you would find, uh, you know, uh, retail um, packaged uh, in your grocery store. Um, this is about, uh, this is a 16 ounce, this is a one pound uh, pack of ground pork. And I just found out from Ron, this is um, about 75 to 80% lean. Um, and, uh, and, and uh, you know, about, 20 to 25 percent uh, fat. Um, we're going to add more fat to this, and probably end up closer to somewhere around 60, 40, or even 50, 50. Um, that is basically how this um, one of the things that makes this um, so delicious: um, pork fat. Um, so the the things that are, we're going to do to increase the fat, you can use back fat, not not very easy to access because um, a lot of a lot of grocery stores just don't sell the straight fat. So this is fresh bacon. You know this is pork belly. Um, uh, you can get it skin on or skin off. Um, we love using the skin here at Mr. Juice for this recipe. Um, but in order to do that, you have to take the skin off, um, boil it, um, get it nice and soft, and then we add that to the ground mixture. Something that you would find in Shanghai as well, Shaolong Bao. One of the most amazing dishes, um, if you ever have the opportunity, uh, soup dumplings. Um, that's how they get the soup inside the dumpling is from a gelatin rich mixture um, uh, stock that, that um, you know, basically becomes jello that you add to your meat. And when it steams, it becomes liquid inside the dumpling. Definitely, if you have if you have a chance to have that dish, it's amazing. Um, I've tried to make it many times. It uh, it's a lot of skill um, involved. So I'm just going to keep practicing, and um, hopefully one day be able to serve it. But um, we have some greens on the recipe. It says uh, kale. Um, you can use cabbage. Um, I happen to have some beet greens. So. Um, this is a, a, a definitely an area that isn't a, a very loose interpretation. I, I wanted to get some greens into it. You can use nettles. That's a, that's also in the recipe. Um, we have these wild nettles here that um, just are so. Um, it's just an interesting flavor that I think you can really add to the background of the pork. 
Um, we have tofu. Um, so this is hodo tofu that we get from just across the bay in, um, in Oakland. They make soy milk fresh there basically every day. Um, uh, and through, through um, the, the process of that soy milk, they make um, a lot of different tofu products. Um, this, is, this is all organic. Um, and there's, I think there's a huge difference of very fresh tofu. Um, it's, it's just so much more earthy. Um, so if you see their products out there, um, get it, try it. I think you'll, you'll agree that it, it's um, completely different than, than uh, most other uh, tofu products out there. Um, this is going to stand in almost as like the bread of, uh, of an Italian meatball. Um, so I, I was trained um, in Italian kitchens um, uh, for the majority of, of my training and, uh, and I love Italian food um, and uh, learning how they made their meatballs. You use bread, usually with, without any crust, you soak it in milk and um, you, you, you basically use that uh, panade, this, this, uh, this, you know, you, you squeeze it out and you have this um, uh, kind of milk uh, soaked bread that you add to the meat that breaks up kind of the structure of, of how, how um, tight the meatball would be. Um, and that's how you end up getting that really f like fluffy texture out of a meatball. Um, for a Chinese meatball, you can get the same kind of uh, um, result by using tofu to stand in to break up the, the structure of, of, of like the bind um, and that's kind of what you want to kind of find. Uh, you want to find uh, a meatball that still holds together, still really nice and round. But when you start to eat it, it it's, it's, it's supple, you know, and I think that's um, a combination of fat and also with, in this case, tofu or bread in the case of an Italian meatball. So, and then we have seasonings here. Um, I'm going to go pretty fast after I explain all these things, but this is just some fresh ginger chopped finely. Um, and then some liquid seasonings. Uh, this is fish sauce, not normally used in, in this recipe. Um, uh, I find that if I can use other kind of umami um, uh, ingredients um, that, you know, I, you know, there's a, there's probably a huge conversation that we can't have here about MSG, um, but I don't use it. Um, and I'm not against it. Um, I, I find that like there's more interesting ways to get deeper kind of um, flavor. Um, and so the fish sauce is one of those things that I, that I think um, does that. Um, soy sauce, this is light soy, uh, not light as in calorie light, or um, this is light in um, characteristic. Um, uh, normally soy sauce is divided just very generally in light, light soy and dark soy. Um, and so uh, you want to use light soy for this. Dark soy would stain the meatball really, really dark. So you don't want that. Just a little salt here. And then milk powder is kind of strange. Um, this gives us um, kind of like uh, some sugar and some protein um, uh, to help with the bind and also just to also like bring some of that um, uh, kind of the characteristics of milk without the liquid qualities of milk um, so that we can kind of add these liquid seasonings and, and, the, and the meat would still be um, just structurally sound. So what I'm going to do, normally we, we take all of these whole pieces of, of pig um, and we uh, um, put them through the, the meat grinder. This recipe started before meat grinders were invented. So um, what I have here is just some of the pork belly, um, just kind of medium diced right now. You can kind of cut this down a little bit further, but generally speaking, um, this didn't stop really a Chinese chef from trying to achieve uh, a, a real like, you know, um, a, a ground pork texture. Um, so when you get into some of the nuance of 
of Chinese cooking, you, you really see some of the qualities that the handmade things really make a difference. Um, dumplings, uh, you know, when you, when you start tasting the difference of what the um, a handmade dumpling tastes like versus a machine made one, um, there's these little parts of when you're tasting it, you can taste the texture of the of the wrapper. And oh, let me make sure I'm in the picture here. Maybe this is a little better. Um, and so, and chopping this as tedious as it could be sometimes to make a really big batch, it really makes a huge difference. Um, when I was taught. Sorry, it's pretty loud, sorry. Um, when I was taught to make sausage, um, you what you're trying to do is actually build a lot of textures. Um, so you, you might be grinding some of the meat twice or keeping some of it in a large die. And then when you mix it all, you get a, a diversity of texture in one bite versus just grinding it all and um, uh, having kind of a a more homogeneous texture. So I would encourage you, even if you get some ground pork, um, try to chop, chop up some of the pork belly. Um, the pork belly will be easier to chop also because of the fat. Take this down. also very fun. So we're almost to the, to the texture I'm looking for. What texture are you looking for? I'm looking for something a little coarse, but when you start to pick it up from the board, it should be a little tacky. Like you see how this is starting to become a little bit, okay. um, like it's come, come, coming together a little bit. Yeah, okay. So from here, we are going to take our ground pork. We're going to take this belly. And I also um, have in the recipe, if you can't get the fresh um, like pork belly, you can very well use bacon here. Um, you know, it, it's going to alter some of the salt and the seasoning. Um, so you want to be careful about that. Um, but you can totally do what I just did, even with bacon, and have it um, in the meatball uh, in place of the fresh pork belly. Um, yeah. Um, so I just want to mix this really well and start adding seasonings to it as I go. I like to add the salt first just because I want to make sure this is all getting um, seasoned evenly here. Um, About how much salt was that? That was, um, let's see, did I not put the amount here? Oh, one teaspoon for, okay. uh, that was, I, so this is, this is gonna be, that's probably about um, more like two tablespoons. Um, we're not trying to season it entirely with salt. I just don't want to season the entire um, pork with soy sauce. Um, I want it to be uh, just a little, I'd say uh, about 50, 50, you know, seasoned with soy and seasoned with salt. Um, okay. Yeah. So then the soy goes in, the fish sauce goes in, and then the milk powder goes in. And you can see if I had added just milk to that, 
it might be too much liquid for this pork to actually absorb. Um, uh, there's actually, um, if you let that kind of just uh, sit for a day, um, you'll be surprised how much, you know, um, how, how much like pork can absorb um, uh, liquid. Um, there's a couple other recipes off the top of my mind that I'm thinking about um, that involve uh, kind of saturating um, ground pork with with uh, stock and steaming it. It's one of my favorite like country Chinese dish um, with ground pork. But anyways, let's get back to these meatballs. Um, so this is getting um, now the ginger. And the same thing we're gonna do, we're just gonna, um, we're gonna, we're gonna chop this uh, ground, uh, we're gonna chop this this tofu up too. How firm is that tofu? This medium. Um, you can use firm, um, and you can use. Um, I'd say, I think you want to kind of avoid um, extra firm and um, soft or silken. Um, so anything in the medium to. I'd say firm range is where you want to be for this. Um, so I'm cutting these just into little strips and then I'm just going to um, just cut this down smaller. And then same thing. I'm just going to just kind of This one makes a little bit more of a mess, but um, yeah, normally we would put this through the meat grinder, um, but it's a good forearm exercise. So yeah, I mean, you want this kind of, I'd say the size of what I would consider like a mince. Do you ever worry and, uh, about- This can go in. Do you ever worry about over overworking this stuff, like chopping that too fine or chopping the meat too much? Or do you ever worry about issues like that or not? I'm not, I'm, I'm not usually like worried about it, but I will say like, Sometimes when you end up, I think tasting, you know, for the first time, some of these some of these things, um, you start to build, I think, a, an opinion that then shapes maybe the next time that you attempt doing it. Um, I think, um, generally speaking, um, I don't feel like the tofu could be too fine, like because it's already pretty firm, it's going to um, uh, really only be um, so fine after after it goes through the grinder. Um, but yeah, if you don't have a grinder, you know, what the purpose of this is, again, is to kind of just break up the bond um, of the ground mixture so that it doesn't become so firm. Um, so, you can kind of see in this that it's, um, you know, it's about, I'd say like 15%, maybe 20, 20% in there now. And so once you, once you, once you kind of mix that through, um, this is a good time. Um, if you are making this recipe, um, kind of differently than, than uh, what I have laid out. You can always just steam off a piece of pork or put it put a little bit in the oven um, and taste the seasoning. Um, kind of adjust from here. Um, but yeah, um, any greens, like I said, is gonna work for uh, what you're gonna add to the mixture. 
Um, we, yeah, like I said, we usually use these wild nettles that are really spiky, um, but they grow wild um, here in the, in, in the northern, northern California. What could um, we use here? Let's see. Um, you could use collard grains. I love, I love some collard grains. Um, and I don't know, what kind of grains do you like, Ron? Like raising greens. <laughs> You're asking me if I like greens, but <laughs> collard greens are probably my favorite, honestly. Like, so I was glad right. to hear you say that. So, yeah. So now you, you start to see really this mixture of greens, tofu, and pork. And so what we have after this, I'm gonna go over what we have in the stock pot. Um, the, maybe the characteristic of a lion's head meatball is that um, where it gets its name from is the shape of the meatball being round. Um, and then the mane of a lion um, kind of being formed by the cabbage, um, the cabbage and the ground pork. That is really the combination um, uh, that is, um, I'd say, common with all lion's head meatball. Um, okay, so I have a stock here and I'm just gonna have you guys Check it out so you guys can see. Um, heavy in mushrooms, uh, dried mushrooms actually. So this is matsutake, um, pine mushroom. Um, uh, these grow here in Northern California. Um, they have a really strong aroma. Um, most of the time they go straight to Japan because they're so highly prized, um, but that's why when you know your farmers, just like knowing Ron from, from Nyman, you get sometimes um, uh, to build relationships with these people and, and understanding these products, um, get, getting some access to understanding, but also actually getting access to the ingredient themselves. Um, so these matsutakis are from uh, um, uh, Northern California, um, like Mendocino area. Um, shiitakes, dry shiitakes, um, just onion, um, chicken stock, um, there's kombu. I think seaweed is something that we've been trying to incorporate more and more into our food um, as a coastal, um, you know, as, as, as living on the coast, um, seaweed is, I think, a lot of the future of our food um, as far as uh, um, the access to, to the abundance of an ingredient that's not being eaten as much as I think maybe it should be. Um, so we try to sneak seaweed in anytime we can. And also what we're trying to do here is really build a lot of surf and turf, a lot of um, umami. Um, so that's the broth we're gonna use for, for, for the, the, the lion's head. Could we use rehydrated uh, mushrooms in that or not? So those, yeah, we soak those um, just in water overnight usually, and then we just throw them straight in. Um, okay. Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. Um, if you don't have, if you're kind of doing this uh, kind of on the fly, then um, just take some hot water, pour it over, um, and then you can start kind of, you know, going from there. Um, so to keep the shape of these guys nice and round, you're going to want to kind of use, uh, you're going to want to like just put them between your hands, really kind of roll them around, get them nice and, and, and round, and um, kind of just make sure that there's no uh, space in between, like any air in there or, or, or anything, because when it cooks, um, that might kind of change the shape 
um, of the meatball. So, you know, you get these nice round uh, meatballs. Lion's head are typically really large meatballs um, that are uh, usually served with broth. So that's why um, I know it sounds kind of strange because uh, maybe uh, some of the meatballs that you've had in the past um, are served with sauce or just served even just um, as they are. Uh, chi the, the, the lion's head is, is um, uh, generally served in, in broth. Um, and uh, so it's, it's not necessarily a soup, um, but the, the broth is there to um, warm up the meatballs, also really keep them really juicy. Um, and what I've been learning more and more about Chinese food is um, because it's a communal uh, cuisine, um, you know, everything is, is meant to be shared um, and brought to the center of the table. Um, the broth being, you know, very hot um, keeps the dish very warm at the center of the table for a longer period of time as well. So um, uh, that also, um, uh, the, 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 the vessel contributes to the temperature as well um, uh, that we're going to cook these in. So this is, um, so pork is, uh, is, is a pretty um, symbolic meat um, during the Lunar New Year. Um, uh, usually I'd say pork is, is, um, is, is really the, uh, one of the centerpieces of, of um, uh, some symbolizing prosperity and, um, uh, and, and really some of the things that, that are also symbolic is, is this round shape. Um, dumplings um, uh, are symbolic um, in, in the Lunar New Year because of its shape as well. Um, it's kind of meant to be uh, symbolic in a sense of um, almost um, bringing your family together. Um, this like full circle kind of like togetherness. Um, uh, so, um, and, and pork being uh, really any animal um, uh, in Chinese uh, dining is really considered luxury because um, the majority of, of the of, of really like the diet in in, um, in China is is very vegetable focused. So having any meat or any fish is always a, a really um, luxurious um, occasion for 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 dinner. Um, okay, so so we're gonna make the lion's head now. So so here's kind of a naked lion head. Here's the mane, the, the cabbage. And what you're gonna do is just put the meatball kind of where the base of the, of the cabbage, um, kind of the stem is, and just kind of work this up and around. And what you end up getting is like, it's kind of cupped around the meatball. Um, what happens is this will uh, kind of insulate it from the broth. Um, also, I like that the tops of these um, start to get a little kind of charred um, from uh, that dry heat that it gets in the oven. Um, so you get another kind of complexity of texture there. So yeah, once again, just like put it right over it. You can kind of see, let me see, is this a better, this might be a better kind yep. of. Yeah. That's great, yep. It's kind of just wrapped around there. And I like to do, you can't, you can't do number, you can't do four, Ron. So I just want to let you know, like we can't do four meatballs because it's, 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 it's a bad number in Chinese culture. Was oh, that what? Okay. I, I wondered if it was something like that. It's gotta be three or five, huh? Let's go three or five. Cause okay. we, we need all the luck. We need all of the, <laughs> we need every good omen and, and, you know, anything that, that we can get going for us this year. And I know everyone's had a, had a hard year. Um, you know, the Lunar New Year is really about looking forward to the next year, no matter what happened last year, whether it was good or bad. 
um, having the opportunity to pour in all of the good luck that you can muster up in these two weeks with all of the customs, all of the, uh, I'd say, uh, uh, all of, I'm going to go three. I'm going to go three because I'm going to show you guys. I kind okay. of like to put a couple of things around here. Um, so yeah, this is all about mustering up every uh, every um, good luck angle that you can you can find. Um, so I use the outers of the cabbage to, to to and I blanch them or steam them, and that's going on the outside of of the of the lion's head. I use the innards to kind of just fill in. Um, I, to, to fill in the rest of the clay pot. Um, one of the amazing things about the clay pot is that we have really the ability to put this right on the stove and then put it right into the oven. Um, so I like to kind of fill the rest of this with the cabbage. Um, in the cookbook, um, so yeah, uh, my cookbook's coming out um, in March. Um, and this, this recipe is in there. Um, there's the photo that you might have seen um, in, in the kind of landing page of, of this event. Um, had these, these, uh, these are called cordyceps. Let me um, show you guys real close. A strange mushroom. Um, very, very high in, um, actually I should get my wife here. She knows all about them, but um, this is um, uh, just really high in antioxidants and, and um, really, really good for you. Um, so I, I like to put these cordyceps in this dish um, just to kind of highlight that mushroom. Um, and also, I think the color is really, really bright and amazing. Um, pine nuts. Um, these, these pine nuts are... Uh, is, is uh, something that is gonna help flavor the broth um, and, and just kind of put another texture that you get when you're kind of eating the dish. Um, and then you're gonna use some broth. And so you're gonna wanna fill this up and you can use hot broth because you're gonna put this on a stove and rewarm it and then go straight into the oven. So a couple of ladles of broth here about, I'd say, three quarters of the way up. And then this is going into the oven. Um, actually, I'm going to put it on the stove, get it nice and hot. And then we're going to put it into the oven. Um, Obviously, cordyceps, not a very easily accessible um, ingredient to get. Um, uh, you can use really any mushrooms. I like to use wild mushrooms here also. In the recipe, I use um, fresh matsutake as well to shave over top. Um, uh, but even if you don't have um, any of these like really exotic, strange, um, unique mushrooms. I love bun mushrooms. I love my take, like a bunch of cultivated mushrooms, shiitake. Um, so don't let it stop you from doing this dish. Um, it's, it's just uh, kind of a way for, for really, a lot of times like in the dining room, I, having these conversations about these ingredients, um, you know, that's really, the, the, the hallmark of, of Nyman Ranch too is when, when we put it as a chef, when I put the name Nyman Ranch on the menu, um, it's there because we're proud of, of our partnership. Um, uh, but we also, as a, like, we want our diners to, to ask us questions about, you know, what, what is Nyman Ranch? What, where is that? What, what makes them so um, special, you know? And, um, you know, I was telling Ron, like I've I've known Nyman for a long time in the Bay Area. It's been um, a, a really a ranch with this history of 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 really going all the way back to um, 
some of the first venues I, I was like observing at Chez Panisse, um, Zuni Cafe, Oliveto, um, um, a lot of the, the real, um, uh, I would say like um, uh, godmothers and godfathers of California cuisine. Um, uh, this, this was, um, this was the pork that if you were, if, if, um, if you wanted people to know the products you're using, this, this was on your menu. So, um, uh, it's, it's just had this amazing legacy as well as the chefs, is, uh, you know, working, working with chefs, um, this whole time, um, and really keeping their standard to the same standard that, that, um, chefs have continued to want out of their products. So, um, I mean, you live and breathe it, Ron, right? I mean, some, some, sometimes more breathing it than I care to, but <laughs> I, I do have a question for you and, and maybe this gets a little bit personal, but I mean, let's talk about what the year's been like. It's been especially hard and it's been really tough on the, the restaurant industry from a personal standpoint, chef, what has kept you inspired and what has given you hope through this whole mess? I think um, a lot of the community, um, yeah, it's been a hard year. Um, there's been so many levels of our society that, that I think have become reflective. Um, and I think um, the optimism comes from a place of knowing that it can be better. And what we had before, you know, it, it, it's been completely slowed down to a halt. Um, but we have this opportunity to make make what we had before better than than it was. And so, when you think about some of the things that that um that we can improve as a restaurant or me as a chef, it's like yes, the food, yes, um, uh, the service, um, but also you know we're thinking about the quality of 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 um, how uh, people are are um, promoted within the restaurant. Um, some of the financial uh, uh, kind of uh, divide that 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 existed um, between servers and 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 and, um, and the kitchen staff, um, how we can make that more equitable, um, both in, um, in you know financially speaking, and also I'd say an opportunity um, uh, that we that we are able to give, and so um, so that's that's definitely part of it. Um, I myself, like, you know, realize kind of, um, kind of what I was sacrificing as well, which is, you know, a lot of a lot of um, time with my wife, um, uh, a lot of, you know, even my, you know, my my uh, personal health um, that I've had time to reflect. Um, so really, like, that's that's really to me a, another thing about <clears throat> um, the Lunar New Year that that. Uh, it's it's a reflection time of of how last year was, um, appreciating the things that 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 um, that you've you've learned or gained from from that from the the course of the entire year, but but also it's a chance to like realign. I mean, as cheesy as it might be um, to have like New Year's resolutions, I feel like sometimes I get two rounds of it. Um, I you know January first, I get I get to reflect and then. I get, I get um, usually a second round in, in the Lunar New Year to think about, um, but it's it, I become more superstitious um, over over uh, over the time as well. Um, year of the Rat last year, how appropriate, um, you know, just to <laughs> stay alive, um, do do anything to um, stay afloat, um, and this year being Year of the Ox, I think. Um, is, is um, very optimistic to think about being consistent and steady, reliable, um, stubborn, um, and, and, and persistent. Um, and that, um, that we're almost towards the end of seeing this all the way through. Um, I, I uh, really appreciate um, everything that's been done to keep our restaurant going. Um, I'm very excited to get people back in our dining room um, oh, and, and be able to feed them the way that we, we normally feed them. Um, uh, but, you know, until then, 
you know, we're, we're trying to stay um, precautious um, um, and ensure that we can provide, um, you know, a safe place to work, but, but also a really fun um, and I'd say um, educational experience while, while we have people here working with us. So what's your gut um, feeling on how this is going to change things long term? Um, my gut, my gut is that we're going to have, um, you know, when I look at even San Francisco, cause I think in the last five years, there's been a lot of, as a San Franciscan myself, like, I think, uh, wanting to make sure that the culture of the city is still available, um, still thriving, um, I think, um, uh, you know, the the tech uh, sector of the Bay Area have, has has really blossomed, and and I, I think even I can't really I mean we've been a beneficiary of of the success of of um, of, of the tech community and 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 how much um, they've invested in San Francisco, but I think to to some like it's made the cost of living so high here. Um, yeah. And and um, and some of the the risk that goes into opening a restaurant, which is, I mean, it's it, you might as well be gambling. Um, uh, it's, I would say, like there was less creative maybe concepts because people were were maybe a little more timid, um, yeah. wanting to make sure that that they even just got through their first first year or two. Um, there's there was massive opening and closing happening in San Francisco because how difficult and competitive it was. Um, my hope is that um, the next couple of years, um, we're going to see a lot of creativity, um, that we're going to see a lot of um, uh, risk taking in the form of concepts for restaurants. I think we've had to make adjustments to learning about groceries, learning about um, uh, takeout, um, uh, learning about, um, uh, consumer packaged goods, um, these things that like we just normally wouldn't have time for. Um, so I think there's going to be more hybrid restaurants too. restaurants that, that have dinner service, but they could be doing other things during the day. Um, uh, yeah, maybe catering, maybe groceries, maybe, um, maybe something that has not even been done yet. Um, so yeah. Creativity is, is really exciting to me um, yeah. that we, we're going to have, an, have, I think, a lot of people that have been really stretched to a lot of the ends of, of their creativity to make things work. And I think maybe in some of that found that they, they actually enjoy some of these things and yeah. that maybe they can work it into their business. Um, Let's hope so. so. That's exciting. Yeah. Let's hope so. I'm getting okay. lots of people saying they want to see what this finished product looks like. Are we getting okay. close? We're, I'm going to give it a check right now. I'll okay. be right back. We'll be right here. Uh, if you're reading in the comments and stuff that uh, Chef Brandon's cookbook, uh, Mr. Juice in, Ty in Chinatown will, if it isn't out, it will be coming out soon. And you can see in the chats where you can get it. And if, if this, what he's prepared for us tonight is any indication of what's going to be in that, chair, that cookbook, it's going to be awesome. So, oh, does he have something? Oh, would you look at that? Would you look at that? <laughs> Hey, how densely packed were the meatballs? That was one of the questions that kept coming through. How, how packed were they? Yes. Um, so I think when you, uh, if you overwork the, the meatball, um, there's two things that could potentially happen. Either um, overmixing can break some of the, 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 the um, kind of the, uh, if you warm up the meat too much, then some of the fat is going to, um, want to leach out right away um so what i was looking for is um bringing it together um and it should feel a little sticky on your hands these are like grandma tips i'm giving you guys because you know this is things that you 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 know is, is a lot of look um it's, it's a lot of feel and it's not you can't really like um describe it but um or, or write it down or anything but it's how, how it feels on your, on your hand, on your palms, when you're mixing. Um, um, it's, it's about how 
uh, round it, it is, but how tacky it is on your hand. So I think what, what I'd like to maybe answer that with is um, uh, you want it to feel like it's have come together and you want to actually feel like pulling your hand off of it, you can start to kind of feel it come up against you, but, but um, uh, you know, it shouldn't be warm and it shouldn't, it shouldn't be crumbling. Um, so somewhere in between there. Okay. Oh, grandma Yang Yang, she's doing you good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. One more question we have here and then we probably better wind it down is uh, uh, another question has or will the chef consider doing a pop-up so that those of us down in the South Bay can also try his cooking. And then they say, pretty please. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I've been saying uh, kind of like, I've, I've been saying yes to a lot of stuff um, in the form of collaborations because I really enjoy um, uh, kind of like really sharing our food with, with um, other communities. And, and um, I'd love to, if you wanna arrange something, um, DM me on Instagram. The, the finish of the dish is really um, something that we do at the restaurant to kind of bring back some of the flavor of the pine nuts is we make an oil um, with rosemary, um, totally not Chinese, but very much, I would say, um, kind of uh, just to heighten some of these flavors, um, really serve as a background. We, we like to put it right on top of the meatball and really kind of make it nice and shiny. Um, and so when it goes to the table, we usually put a cover on it, open it up, and you get that aroma of uh, that that uh, the pine. So the, the the pine coming from the matsutake, the pine nuts in in the dish, and then that rosemary oil really kind of like solidifies that flavor when you're tasting through the dish. So I hope you guys enjoy. That, that looks absolutely awesome, Guy. It really does. <laughs> it does. Well, thank you. thank you for what you've done, Jeff. That's good. I, I, I want to thank everybody that uh, watched with us tonight. I want to thank everybody that put a comment in there. And I especially want to thank you, Brandon, for your expertise and, and what you did. Um, at the end of the day, let's all remember to support local independent restaurants and, and especially those that like air in local Chinatowns. And for Guy's sakes, run out and buy Brandon's cookbook. So thank you all for being there and have a good evening. There it is. You see it there right it there. It's the only copy out right now. So okay. March 9th, March okay. 9th, you can, you can pick it up. Hopefully your local bookstore. Awesome. Look forward to it. Thank you. Bye everybody. Thanks, Ron. Thanks Diamond Ranch. <laughs>